Notre Dame required colossal foundations, which would be invisible. Its contemporary, the Basilica of Saint-Denis, can help us understand construction techniques of the Middle Ages. You can see here that they used all types of stone, sometimes abandoned stone from quarries. You can see traces of old joints. There's also cut stone, already prepared, set and squared off. All this vast work was invisible and enabled the immensity and beauty of what was to come, but in itself was a masterpiece, a hidden masterpiece. So how was this hidden masterpiece designed and constructed? The building work started in Notre Dame with the choir. The first stage was to dig deep enough to find strong enough soil to hold the colossal amount of stone for the building's foundations. The geological conditions of Ile de la Cité weren't favorable. They had to keep digging all the way down to a depth of nine meters. Nine meters down, you have to take the height of the quayside you can see behind me, which is about six meters, and add half the depth again in order to reach the level at which the foundations were laid. Not only is the level very deep, but it's submerged in water. Every winter the water would rise, the soil would be affected, and the foundations would become unstable, not solid enough. There was a huge risk of the land slipping under the cathedral's foundations, causing the work to be deformed higher up. To ensure the stability of the foundations in this waterlogged soil, the master mason decided to sink huge wooden stakes deep into the subsoil. Sinking poles into the riverbed underneath the foundations was a way of preventing the foundations being washed away and the cathedral being deformed. Once these stakes were in place, the builders were able to construct the foundations with limestone and mortar. They're going to create a kind of network of foundations, and they're going to look a little bit like a pyramid. They're going to be wider at the base and narrower at the top as you rise to ground level. At nine meters deep, the foundations of Notre Dame had another peculiarity. Just like at Saint-Denis, parts of old religious buildings, demolished to make place for the cathedral, were used. As with these column bases, in those days, stones had power. They radiated. They were charged with energy, like our modern-day batteries. To put it simply, they transmitted a symbolic force, and they bestowed on the walls not only protection, but also continuity with ancient buildings. The foundations built during the 1160s were one of the main strengths of the cathedral. This strength was combined with the power of the stone. It was present in the Parisian subsoil, ready to be picked like ripe fruit. The raw materials necessary were found in the surrounding hills. Sedimentary rock deposited 45 million years ago, according to the geologists, in warm, shallow seas, which sound lovely, leaving magnificent limestone, typical of the center of the Paris Basin. The slopes of the River Seine and its tributaries had banks of limestone. The Seine carried them all the way into Paris and thus provided the building site with all its needs. Even though Notre Dame was built in stone, it could not be finished without another material, wood. Wood scaffolding was essential in the building of the cathedral. The wood came from forests owned by the bishopric. When we look at a cathedral now, we don't think about wood. 
But we would not be able to build a cathedral without vast amounts of wood coming up as a kind of frame all around the stone walls as they emerge from the ground. Thanks to wood, stone and the skill of its builders, the cathedral's choir took shape. Within a few years, they got as far as the galleries. While the builders erected the clerestories, they also started on building the flying buttresses with a 12-metre reach. These would ensure the stability of the vaults to come. Building such arches was a technological challenge. It must have blown everybody away. I mean, it was a spectacle, in a sense, to see these external arches rising up so high to support the walls and the roof. Once this was completed, iron hooks would be inserted into the masonry to reinforce and strengthen the walls. But before constructing the vaults, the building needed a wooden framework to cover it. The first one would be replaced during the following century, but its role was vital. It was important to erect the framework before the vaults, because the framework obviously protected the building, but also gave it a bulk, filled it out to such an extent that the walls were braced and wouldn't move. Once the framework was up, then the materials required for constructing the vaults could be levered up by special mechanisms. A treadwheel crane, or squirrel cage, was one of these mechanisms. Charges of up to several hundred kilos could be lifted by rope and pulley, activated by a wheel, turned by two men walking inside the crane. The cage was a motor which, along with a rope and a pulley mechanism, enabled anything to be lifted up to 100 meters high. The squirrel cages were so important in the Middle Ages that they turned up in illuminated manuscripts. Such was the pride in the devices. The huge wooden timbers intended to support the vault arches were almost certainly raised into the cathedral rafters thanks to a squirrel cage. When those vaults are going up, they were the highest in the known world, and they were therefore some of the most ambitious building projects in Europe at the time. The second stage of the construction of the vaults involved the masons placing the stones on the timbers one by one starting with the keystone. The rest of the stones, already cut to size, were placed afterwards and fixed with mortar. The keystone is put in place first because its position determines where the center is. This then enables the timbers to be repositioned and the necessary material for the rib vault can be laid out. Here they're doing this for the first time so high. Imagine the impact of this on people walking by and seeing these arches in, up in the air and thinking, oh my goodness, how is this ever going to stand up? Once the arches were in place, they could be used as a fulcrum to construct the panels. The last stage was the most delicate of all when the timbers were removed. This was when the risk of collapse was at its highest. However, there has never been any recorded trace of any accident involving these record-breaking 35-metre high vaults. The construction of the vaults started with the positioning of the arches, and then that of the panels above them. They were gigantic, covering almost 100 square metres. In spite of their relative thinness, between 20 to 30 centimetres, Notre Dame's vaults proved to be incredibly efficient during the fire of April the 15th, 2019. They bear witness to the genius of their medieval builders, protecting the major part of the cathedral, not only from the flames, but from the thousands of litres of water used to put out the fire from above. Eleven seventy-seven. The cathedral choir was consecrated just seventeen years after the work had been instigated by Maurice de Sully. 
Since it was closed off from the rest of the construction, it was able to house a whole set of sacred relics from the Paris Sea. Objects that had belonged to saints or fragments of their bodies, revered by worshippers. You can think of the relics as the presence of the sacred on Earth. I like to think of sacred relics as, a, as the battery that powers the machine of a sacred building. Amongst these relics, a strand of hair supposedly belonging to the Virgin Mary, a stone that had been used to lapidate Saint Etienne, or an arm that allegedly belonged to Andrew the Apostle. So we're talking about an arsenal of holy weapons there to protect not just the community of the dean and his chapter and the bishop and his power, but the whole city of Paris.